Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, this is loud, okay. <laughs> Thank you every, everyone for inviting me to give this talk. I'm going to be talking about the future of voice computing in the ear. Um, as mentioned, I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called Smart Ear. Um, but before I go further, I have a confession to make, and that is I am not a developer. I've been in the hearing space for the last 20 years, um, as both as a researcher at MIT, Harvard, and Stanford, and as a research scientist at Advanced Bionics and Earlens. But through my journey space, what I came to conclude is that the ear is the optimal location for the next computing platform. And hopefully by the end of this talk, I could convince you guys of the same thing. So currently, people interact with applications primarily using a visual interface. For example, with Cisco Spark, some people might use it on a smartphone, others use it on a tablet or a laptop or even a Cisco board. However, more and more people are realizing the power of voice. For example, we know how popular Amazon Echo is um, and how Apple and Google are following suit. The great thing about these devices is you can communicate hands-free. But the disadvantage is that it's not mobile. You can imagine you can't carry Amazon Echo to your workplace. And I think that's why um, voice assistants on the smartphone have become so popular. It's been predicted that by 2020, more than half of the searches will be via voice. But the problem with smartphone voice assistants is that you still need to use your hand. In other words, you have to take the smartphone out of your pocket to use voice. And that's why I think there's still a debate on what is the final form factor that a voice assistant will take. Um, but regardless of what that final form factor is, we truly believe that to have a true voice computing requires a complete platform so that the developers can really control the whole user experience. So what I mean by that is a device has to be really tightly integrated to a software platform that we call ELS, and I'll explain that a little bit later, so which converts text into voice. And then we also need an AI engine so that we can talk to this device in a much more natural way, just like we talk to people. So throughout the talk, I'm going to talk about each of these three components in more detail. Again, I know most of you are developers, so I'm going to skim through the device really quickly. So as I mentioned earlier, currently voice via the smartphone is a very hands it's not hands-free. You still have to touch these buttons. The great thing about possibly having an ear device in your ear, if it's comfort to, comfortable to wear all day, and if there's microphones and speakers in it, then you can imagine you have a voice assistant or a messaging platform in your ear. Also, another problem of using voice assistant on a smartphone, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have uh, experienced this, is that it works great in a quiet room like this. However, if you're in a work environment in, a, in which it's very loud, for example, in a healthcare setting, construction, or even when you're on the streets trying to message your colleagues, it doesn't work very well. And that's because automatic speech recognition significantly decreases in loud environments. The advantage of having an ear device in your ear is twofold. First of all, the ear is designed to know the difference between signal and noise. What do I mean by that? If I'm in a group, I usually face the person I'm interested in talking to. If the person on the, the right is becoming more interesting, I face that person. And so there's a lot of auditory cues that naturally uh, exist if a device is in your ear. Secondly, um, because we have control over the exact signal that goes into automatic speech processing, we could do a lot of digital signal processing to it. In other words, we could do active noise cancellation. In other words, if I'm in a factory floor, I could cancel all that uh, sounds of the machines so that they could hear my voice much more clear clearly. I could also do things like directional voice capture. What that means is if I have multiple microphones in each, each ear, then I can very fine-tunely hear just the person in front of me and cancel surrounding sound. So if you put a much cleaner signal into the automatic speech recognition system, as you can imagine, you get much better results. <clears throat> now to the more juicy part, 
that you guys are interested in, the your operating system or, or our software platform. When we say your operating system, it's really not operating system in the traditional sense. What I really mean is that we have a tightly integrated software that sits in three locations. One is on the ear device. So on the ear device, we do some audio processing that I mentioned earlier. We do directional voice capture. We do active um, noise cancellation. We also have some embedded commands on the device so that even though you're not connected to the phone or the cloud, um, you can do things like uh, power, on, power off the device, um, turn on and off the noise cancellation system. We also have a very unique feature on our device called audio buffering or 30 second recording. For example, if I'm at a conference like this and I meet 10 people, unfortunately I have very bad memory and I forget their names. Um, with this device, if I tap on the device or if I say, oh, that's very interesting, it will capture the last 30 seconds, translate it, and put it in a database. And finally, we do Bluetooth management on the device. And that's very important because Bluetooth is such a huge power drain. Finally, on the handset is where we keep user configuration. We also keep learned preferences. For example, I might have a VIP contact list in which only certain people could contact me at certain times. For example, I, during the workday, I probably want to hear all my messages from my boss, but maybe other people, I don't want to hear their messages. So that's our learned preferences. We have some embedded um, automatic speech recognition on the handset itself, so that even though you're not connected to the cloud, you can understand some voice commands. Of course, we have server protocols. Um, uh, we also support voice biometrics. What that means is I can authenticate using my voice print. Um, we do smart notifications and input-output optimization. And then finally, in the cloud is where we do all the AI. Again, I'll go more in detail about that AI engine in the next, the last section. But this just shows that we have the database and the audio files, and the, we do data indexing in the cloud. We actually use a third-party automatic speech recognition system. We're currently using Microsoft, Google, and also Kelby. Why we're using Kelby is that this allows us to also um, send audio clips. Um, on top of that, on top of the ASR is we have our deep learning engine. And what that deep learning engine allows you to do is to understand, as I mentioned before, natural language conversation. It's able to personalize the sound settings for you and the environment that you're in. It allows us to create um, different ontologies automatically. It will be able to figure out when and how a person wants to get messages. For example, right now it listens and says, hey, I'm giving a, this person's giving a talk. Maybe we won't give all these notifications right now, which would be very nice. And then voice recognition correction. So what's the benefit of Smart Your, your Operating System? First of all, it, develops, it enables developers to build um, voice applications without having to change their back end. In other words, they could um, create apps just as they are currently, and we are responsible for changing that text to voice. And the advantage of having a tightly coupled software platform that connects a device, the smartphone, and the cloud is that because of that, we can better control and have optimal battery utilization. For example, as I mentioned earlier, Bluetooth is a huge drain. And so we can make sure that we only turn the Bluetooth on only when we need it. Also, we can make sure we have very the best response time possible. For example, all the audio processing is done on the device and not in the cloud. So again, you don't have that time lag. And finally, we have features unique to the device. So we have started the integration of Cisco Spark REST API to our ear operating system. Um, we support a lot of, we voice enable many of the concepts that exist in Cisco Spark, such as the concept of rooms, membership, teams, and we can do things like list, you know, create um, rooms, get the details of rooms, get an update on rooms, uh, delete people from rooms. But one of the interesting things we could do is, for example, watch a room and get audio notifications if somebody posts that room. 
So currently, we're using webhooks to connect the REST API to our EOS cloud server. Um, and we've started developing our AP, Smart Year API, and it's right now under development. But if anybody's interested in developing, developing to it, I would love to talk offline about it. And then finally, we use a third-party push service. Specifically, we're using the Firebase Cloud Messaging so that we can push notifications to our client. So what will Smart Ear API provide? It'll provide natural language understanding and dialogue manager. We'll have some pre-built um, agents, such as you know, so things that do support, um, reminders, um, and maybe we could, we're could thinking about doing language translation. Next, we also do entity and intent extraction from the message body. In other words, if I say, tell Susie I'm running five minutes late, it will understand that I want to send a message to Susie saying that I'm five minutes late. We can easily create new domains, and I'll explain why that's so easy to do with our deep learning engine um, in the next section. Uh, we have a notification manager so that we get only notified when we want it. We have a conversational manager. We convert also text to speech and speech to text. And finally, we provide some analytics and reporting. So now, what kind of applications can we build with the Smart Year EOS API? Um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, currently people are interacting with the Cisco Spark, mostly via visual. However, you can imagine a lot of enterprise settings, such as healthcare, fuel service, construction, hospitality, retail, manufacturing, logistics, and sales. Um, you can imagine you want to do the, communicate with your colleagues in a hands-free way. Right? You don't want, for example, you can imagine in manufacturing, you don't want to take off your gloves, take your phone out, your tablet, and then message your colleagues. Right? This is hands-free. You can do it and in a loud environment, too. So here are just a little bit more details about just two of the scenarios. One is healthcare. Right? Um, currently, we're talking to a message platform that specifically deals with the healthcare sector. Um, and it connects the nurses, the staff, and the doctors. Currently, what they're doing is they're taking the smartphone off and saying, hey, this is emergency room seven. But obviously, that's not what they want to do. And so Smart Ear will be able to do this hands-free. Again, if they are using, using Cisco, Cisco Spark, we could do the same thing. And then another use case is manufacturing. Again, not only will it allow for hands-free messaging, but we do all that sound processing to make sure that your message is conveyed as clearly as possible to the recipient. Now let's talk about that deep learning engine. So our deep learning engine is focused on natural language processing obviously. Um, and our neural net is initially trained first by crawling the web to get the idea of what our sentence is, you know, that they're made out of words, that they're phrases, that they're paragraphs, and just the structure of a sentence. Next, we also um, add, um, use databases such as DBpedia. So DBpedia is really a Wikipedia that's structured. And what that helps us do is get a better understanding of ontology. So what ontology is, is a relationship between words. For example, it understands the fact, for example, in the messaging domain, that when I say ping, tell, contact, whisper, whatever those words are, that all refer to the idea of sending a message. And that Susie, Richard, Tracy, those are recipients of a message. And then finally, we also train it with some natural language query sets. The great thing about having using deep neural net to do this is that it automatically makes, generates ontology. Um, and the advantage of that is previously when voice assistants were initially made, these ontologies were, had to be manually made by hundreds of linguistic PhDs who would put all these words in categories to talk about how these words are all related. However, because these, are now, these ontologies are now automatically generating using our deep learning engine, we're able to first of all make a very much global model. The advantage of global model is that if we want to support new domains, we could do it much more quickly. For example, as I mentioned right now, we are supporting messaging. However, if we want to also be able to support the integration to Google Maps, 
we don't have to redo most of this, right? We have a global map, a global model. We only have to fine tune it for words related to maps, such as location, right, left, timing, distance. And yes, and then we fine tune this neural net by um, using a training sets that we get from getting a bunch of people in a room. Um, and asking them, for example, a hundred ways of saying that they want to message someone. And we've been doing this for six months and collecting a lot of li live data specifically on the messaging domain. And finally, we use feed forward network to do ASR correction for contact names. And that's especially important for foreign names. For example, my name is Kinu, and Siri thinks I'm a boat. So, Hopefully, this one will think I'm a human. And finally, the result of a, uh, the training will be a runtime model that outputs intent and entities. So in other words, the intent is to send a message, and entities is to Dean. So what's the advantages of using deep learning? It understands contextual dialogue. It's able to um, be able to notify you exactly when you want it. It allows you to do auto ontologies, and it also is able to control your auditory environment in a natural way. So let me talk a little bit more about what I mean by this um, true conversational interface. So again, it, it can extract um, a user's intent and intention just by natural way of speaking, right? Previously, um, I remember when you had to have a structured way of saying something or the assistant wouldn't understand. Now I could just say casually, hey, um, ping Dean that I'm running five minutes late. Actually, um, tell him that I will be five minutes late instead. Whatever it may be, I could just talk naturally as if I'm talking to a human being. Um, it makes use of context to track a user's intent across multiple dialogue turns. What I mean by that is, here's an example. The aqua is Tom, the user, and Ada is our assistant. So it says, Ada, can you please tell the executive team to meet me in the conference room B in 10 minutes? The assistant says, OK, ready to send? Wait, cancel that. Can you have a meet me in conference room D in 15 minutes? OK, ready to send? Actually, let's also ask the marketing team to this. You could imagine doing this on Cisco Spark, right? But this has a much more flexible way of, again, changing the recipient, adding recipients, and changing even the content of the message. Um, also, it supports um, contextual dialogue and remembers your preferences. For example, on my contact list, I might have 10 different Richards. But it understands that Richard Ling is the person I talk to the most, and therefore will ask me, won't tell me, ask of all these Richards, they'll just say, do you want to send the message to Richard Ling? And I would probably say yes. And finally, ASR correction to improve name recognition. As I mentioned earlier, we use a deep learning engine to also make sure that you, don't, you get important notifications only when you need it. In other words, if it was a simple Bluetooth, that means all my notifications from my phone will arrive in my ear. If, again, if, I, if, if right now during the talk I was wearing a device and it was pinging me, I think I would probably throw the device away. So it's very important to really be able to hear the auditory environment and give notifications only when I need it and only from important people for me at that time. Finally, auto-ontologies, as I mentioned, we can easily support other domains um, in two weeks versus six months if it was done manually. And finally, auto automatic auditory management. This is how it is, and it works, you know, assistants work fabulously in quiet rooms like this. However, it doesn't work in an in environment such as a manufacturing floor. But now with this device, you can do all that sound processing so that it's as, as if that person is in a quiet conference room. Finally, with the integration of the Smart Ear um, API and Spark, we can now have Cisco Spark in your ear. That means we can have hands-free communication and that it will work in all auditory environments. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Kinuko.